So our last speaker of the day, she's a senior staff engineer at uh, senior staff software engineer at Bizarre Voice, and you might have seen her speak at one of the thousands of JavaScript conferences she speaks of, or you might have seen her flying in the skies because she even has her own pilot's license. Please give it up for Rebecca Murphy. Uh, I hadn't heard that song. Oh my God, it's bright. Uh, I hadn't heard that song. Um, I'll talk while my slides come up um, until they sent and said, like, what song do you want to play? And so I hadn't heard it in years and years. Um, and it just makes me happy to hear it now. Uh, I did everything they told me to. So. Uh, oh, I can say this part because I don't need slides to say this part. Um, Nordic JS, pretty good. So high fives to all the organizers and for flying us all in and for um, taking care of us like just tremendously <laughs> for the last two days. Um, I get to go to lots of these things, like you said, and uh, this is a good one. So clap, clap for that. I also have a uh, Wemo, like Jake, uh, Phil Hawksworth taught us both well. The problem, the reason I put my wrist strap on is because often mine doesn't work, and this keeps me from throwing it when that happens. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about deploying client side apps at Bizarre Voice. Uh, so uh, I am a senior staff software engineer, which the more like seniors and staffs they add on, the harder it gets to say. Um, <clears throat> and I'm here today to talk to you about how we've been rethinking client-side application development at Bizarre Voice. Um, Kate actually set this up really well yesterday for me um, in talking about kind of the challenges that you start to run into <clears throat> as, you, uh, as you work with tools that seem really comfortable and helpful at first, tools like Grunt or Gulp. Um, and so hopefully you saw that talk because that leads in really well to, to this one. I, I want to also say that um, you know there have been great talks like Paul's and Jake's um, today that were um, very much like here's a thing that you need to know and you need to take back and think about and do when you get home. This is not that. Um, this is very much a talk about how we thought about this problem at Bizarre Voice and how we thought about it may be entirely wrong for you based on your team, your tech, your needs, etc. <clears throat> So yeah, this is very much a, a kind of chance for you to peek behind the curtain at how we think about these things and how we thought about this problem that we had. And just to set the scene, so if you haven't heard of Bizarre Voice, you're pretty normal, um, and that's OK. Uh, Bizarre Voice uh, does lots of things, but kind of our bread and butter is ratings and reviews, <coughs> collection and display, and analytics and those sorts of things for major brands and retailers. So. Uh, I don't know, I should have looked this up before I came to find out like who I could talk about in, in uh, Sweden. But uh, certainly in, in the UK, Tesco is one of our customers. In the US, you've probably heard of like Walmart um, and other large retailers. If it's not Amazon and it's not eBay and you see stars on the page, there's a good chance that you're seeing Bizarre Voice software. <clears throat> I worked for about a year and a half. Um, I, I've been at Bizarre Voice for two and a half years. And the first year and a half that I was there, I worked on the third party JavaScript app that is responsible for displaying and collecting ratings and reviews on our customers' pages. Um, this is a single page app that lives in other people's pages. Uh, I like the OPP uh, as, as the way to describe third party JavaScript, so thanks to my colleague Mike Panisi for coming up with that one. Um, this is a single page app that runs in other people's pages. So we don't control the environment in which this application runs. And I have a whole other talk about that and all the fun that that means um, when you can't count on you know, the fact that there should only be one body on the page, as an example. Um, <clears throat> that really happened, and we have real code that has to handle that. Uh, so, so it's, it's uh, readings and reviews, brands and retailers, single page app, other people's pages. Um, and the way that this works, there's one code base for this, right? 
because um, it would be crazy to have a different code base for every single customer that we have, which is why we did that for the first seven years that we were in business. Um, so it, this is a single code base for all of our customers, and we do a, you know, customers configure the application using a tool. Based on that configuration and using that shared code base, they, um, when they say, yes, I'm ready for this, they click a button, and we generate a build of this application based on their configuration information. So if they have certain features turned off, their build doesn't include that feature. Uh, it doesn't include the code or the CSS for that feature. If they um, you know, want their buttons to be blue or their stars to have points on them instead of curves, which is another real thing that we had to build, um, then, then their, their, build, their build is their build. And it's not just a build per customer, it's a build for every site the customer has, and it's a build for every locale that that site supports. So when you're looking at um, kind of an umbrella uh, customer and like Gap, for example, they actually have lots and lots of sites. Uh, I can't remember exactly how many sites, but let's say a dozen, and they might support, we have the ability to offer them support for 130 locales. So you do the math, and if Gap needs to rebuild uh, the application for all of their sites, suddenly we have to do potentially 1,300 builds. No, yes, 130 times 10, 1,300. Good at that. Um, so it's a lot of builds, and that's for just one customer, and we have a lot of customers. And so, you know, the day that we actually ship a bug or something and we have to fix it for everyone, suddenly, we have to build a new single page, like you build the static assets for a single page application for you know, the number of customers we have times the number of locales times the number of sites. It gets to be a pretty big number. Um, so this is a thing that's kind of unique about, not necessarily unique about Bizarre Voice, but it, it might not be something that you deal with if you're working with, um, you know, you're controlling a single page app that you put on your site. Um, you build that once. Maybe you build it many times a day if you're doing CI and stuff, but still, you build it once, not hundreds or even potentially thousands of times. Um, so yeah, any time that we make a mistake or any time that our customer makes a configuration change and wants that configuration change out in the world, we have to do a lot of builds for them. So what's a build? Um, a, a build in our uh, universe, this is just my list of the steps that we do. You don't doesn't matter. The point is there's you know, somewhere in the ballpark of 15 steps before I stopped writing them down. Um, and, and so a build to take the customer's configuration and to take the application code and turn it into something that will actually like, make there be stars and words on their website involves going through all of these steps in order to, to actually produce that output. Um, and so that's cool. And those are the post-it notes that I used to figure this all out. Uh, the problem is that um, the way that this was written initially is that um, right now we have servers that sit and wait to be told, please do a build. Um, and those servers sit there and sit there and sit there and cost us money, whether they're doing anything or not. Thankfully, they're cheap, but still. Um, but so when I get a request to do a build, they run four grunt tasks. This is, <laughs> they're like, oh, step two. <laughs> Uh, so, so they're like shelling out to, there's a node process that sits and shells out to like, you know, exec um, four different grunt commands. And when I saw this, like, it's hard, it's a hard day. Um, when I saw that, because we have four grunt tasks performing those 15 or so steps, like those aren't the same number. Uh, and so this is, this is kind of terrible, and it's terrible for a lot of reasons. Um, Probably the biggest reason is that those four grunt tasks don't map <laughs> to steps. Each of the grunt tasks encompasses some set of steps. And when you uh, do that, and you aren't really, 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 really super careful um, and thoughtful about the pain that you're causing to someone down the line, then what you end up doing is writing grunt tasks where the individual steps performed by this one grunt task 
get all entangled and depend on state that's shared across the execution of that grunt task. And so disentangling them, or God forbid, adding a step in the middle of one of them, um, or, or doing some A-B testing or anything like that, becomes um, just impossible. Like not just hard, but actually like the risk is not worth it. And so you end up with this build system that just sits and um, rots kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's also really difficult to track down when something goes wrong. And so if, if somewhere in one of those four grunt tasks, one of the 15 steps fails because you know, some service that they rely on isn't responding, um, then we can lose a whole build as the result of that. And it's very difficult to track down, like we know it happened in like a grunt task two, but we don't really know, figuring out exactly where it happened and why and what the kind of state of the system was is incredibly difficult. Um, and, and this also means that, you know, like I kind of just said, our, our team felt really powerless to make any changes to the system. It was very much a, no one touches that except for Rebecca. <laughs> She seems to understand this, and so we'll just let her do that. Uh, and that's a, that's a terrible <clears throat> situation for me to be in, and it's a terrible situation for the team to be in. So backing up here, like, what is a build, right? Like, or a deployment, or when, you know, whatever you want to call it, the generation of the static assets that support a single page application, which in our case is a couple of JavaScript files, a CSS file, um, some font files, some images, those sorts of things. So any build is fundamentally a set of steps. Notice I didn't say series because those steps might be able to execute in parallel. So it's a set of steps. Some are maybe serial, some may be parallel. They're triggered by some initial input, the please make me a build because I just changed my buttons from red to blue. And they produce some final output, which is this collection of static assets that let there be a single page application. Um, and, and in a sufficiently complex system, there's always the possibility of failure. Um, pretty much as soon as you start stringing more than two steps together, or as soon as you start relying on some outside service, um, you know, if you've ever worked with user generated content or customer configured applications, like there is always some possibility that something is going to go wrong. So if we define a build like that, um, then we can zoom in and say, like, what is a step, right? A step is some unit of work. And it might be asynchronous, it might not. Uh, it probably requires some input so it knows what to do, and it probably produces some output, um, because otherwise, why did you run it? Um, and it might depend on some external resource, and so it, again, has the potential to fail or to be in some like incomplete state while it waits for that external resource to wake up or recover or whatever. So different build processes and, and honestly, different instances of the same build process might work in different ways depending on uh, the input to the process. Um, and the state of the system that the process relies on. So you could have a really simple workflow, which is just like, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, done. We could have a workflow where it's like, do this, and then once that's done, do these three things, let me know when they're all done, and we'll come back and finish the build. And we could have a case where ideally these would run in series, but we need to be able to recover from failure without losing the build. So we could have a, a case where a, process, a workflow starts um, and one of the steps fails, we try it again, the step fails, we try it again, this time it works, and we proceed with the workflow. So if we think about that simplest case of a series, literally a series of steps that execute one after another, we could you know, we know JavaScript, we can represent it pretty easily as something like this. Here is the definition of a process that has steps, the steps, um, steps are an array of objects, and each object uh, describes an individual step, and these should be executed in order. Um, each step also has a name, um, and it has an indication of the kind of step that it is. So here we uh, read the you know request that came in, like, please make me a build. Uh, and we're like, cool, I'm going to generate a random number 
because that's useful. And um, finally, it says, given the um, build message that came in and given this random number, I'm going to send an email. So you can see in that last line there, it, it uses the input of two of the earlier steps. I'm sorry, it uses the output of two of the earlier steps as the input to the final step. And so we've got that. Now it's pretty easy to make a leap to like, OK, we said that steps might be asynchronous. We said that steps receive input, produce output. Um, cool. Promises are pretty useful. Um, so we'll, we'll use those. Um, and we define a step as a module that exports a function. The function receives as its argument the input to the step. And it returns a promise that resolves with the output of the step. You know, none of this is like a huge logical leap once you start to kind of dissect like what is a build and how should this work. So we had figured all this out. Um, you know, this is what a step looks like. This is what a, a process looks like, and how we can you know communicate that oh, this uses the this step uses the output of this step, and those sorts of things. Um, and we talked through a pretty <laughs> elaborate. Um, me and uh, my colleague. This is not my water. Um, me and, uh, but thanks, Jake, wherever you are. My water is lukewarm, but full. Uh, we had talked through um, this like really elaborate um, system that we were going to build using you know lots of EC2 instances and queues and blah blah. blah. Um, and uh, much credit to my colleague Lon, Lon Ingram, who uh, sat through that lovely meeting with me, and another colleague who doesn't like to be named, and so I shall not name him. Uh, and and we so we had a system like design that we were going to use to actually make that work. Um, but I was really dreading building it because like I had made this, um, you know that the developer interaction with the system really pleasant and simple by defining these steps and the workflows and all that. But making something that was going to actually execute that, once we talked through all the details of it, seemed hard. <laughs> um, but I was going to do it. So around that time, I went out to lunch with my friend Joe. Um, he's another pretty senior JavaScript, or not JavaScript, another senior Java developer at Bizarre Voice um, who uh, yeah, he's he's been around the block and he he knows a few things. Um, these are not literally the tacos that I ate, but if you ever come to Austin and you want some tacos, you should eat those tacos. It's the Trailer Park Trashy up in the upper left, and that is the shrimp taco uh, in the lower right. And I'm quite sure that I actually ordered those two tacos. So it's very convenient to find this picture on the internet. Uh, so, so I went out to lunch with him, and I was telling him all about this project and kind of the challenges and the system that we had designed, and um, that I was kind of dreading building, building it. Um, and he told me about this thing called SWIFT. Um, and it wasn't that SWIFT, because that would be sad. Um, Y'all are way too young if you didn't laugh harder at that. Uh, <laughs> So Swift is actually the Swift that he was talking about is Amazon's simple workflow. This is not an ad for Amazon that I'm doing, um, but it, you know, we use Amazon Web Services at work. And so uh, there are other ways to implement what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, but turns out they already did, so that was handy for us. Um, and so simple workflow is, uh, you know, it is an implementation of this Thing that turns out actually has a name, and you know, a bunch of JavaScript developers sitting in a room had never heard of it, uh, called orchestration, the automated arrangement, coordination, and management of complex computer systems, middleware, and services. Now, when you read that, you wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a JavaScript build. Um, but when you define a JavaScript build, as we did, and then you read that, you're like, oh, yeah, that's a JavaScript build. And, and the so, simple workflow is a um, system built for orchestration. And the way that Simple Workflow works um, is that you tell Simple Workflow, please start me a workflow instance. Um, and, and so you send that message to Simple Workflow saying, I need a workflow instance. In the meantime, you have a decider, uh, insert George Bush joke here, uh, worker running, and you have an activity worker running. And the decider worker is constantly asking Swift, do I need to decide anything? Do I need to decide anything? Do I need to decide anything? And it uses long polling to do this. 
Um, and then eventually, because you just sent this, this message to Simple Workflow, Simple Workflow says, why, yes, I do need you to decide something. I have this workflow execution that has been sent to me, and I need you to decide what we should do first. And the decider says, this is a lovely workflow execution that you've sent me. I see that you have done nothing. Why don't you do step one? Um, and so the, it says, do step one. And Simple Workflow is like, Cool. It waits for an activity worker to come and say, I know how to do step one. Do you have anything for me? I know how to do step one. Do you have anything for me? And it, again, is long pulling simple workflow to ask that question. And eventually, simple workflow says, why, yes, here is an activity for you to do. And so you can imagine, like, it's just this constant ping pong back and forth uh, between the decider and, and the activity workers. And you can have a number of activity workers running. They can, you can have an activity worker that only knows how to do step one because step one is really hard, um, or step one like is Python and not JavaScript or whatever. Um, so you can, you can uh, you know, scale this system really efficiently. Also, your decider. It, it, making decisions is really easy, and so that can be a really underpowered machine, whereas the activity worker can be kind of right-sized to the task. Um, so you, you, this is an example of what this might look like. This is a, a, an image from the Amazon website. An example of what this might look like for a really simple um, purchase process, right? Um, where, you know, the order gets verified, the credit card gets charged, the order gets shipped, and we record that the process is completed. Um, it seems like every one of those dots is some like moment that something had to happen, so it can seem really complex. Um, and it, this is actually what Joe told me when he was talking to me about this. He was like, you know, simple workflow is really cool, but a thing that you need to know is that it can be really confusing because things can happen out of order. Um, and you like you don't know when something is going to happen. You have to be able to react to it. And I was like, dude, we do this. Like we got this. We're just fine. So out of that system, out of that conversation rather, was born a system that we call Pontiac. Uh, we call it Pontiac because the application that it was built to build is called Firebird. And if you're into American muscle cars, then there's a joke there somewhere, too. Um, so it's a system that lets you describe a workflow much like the set of steps that I showed. Um, and then it executes that workflow, workflow for you using Swift, using Amazon Simple Workflow. Um, and it manages all of the passing data from one step to another. Um, it manages spinning up the activity workers that know, you know, given this workflow configuration and given these, these definitions, these module definitions that receive input and return a promise, it manages all of this for you. Um, it also is able to handle retries. It's also able to handle timeouts. It's also able to handle um, running steps concurrently. Um, and it can do all of this because that orchestration, like I was able to write all of that because that orchestration layer was already written for me. And that was honestly the hard part. Once you have that layer that can do this orchestration for you and manage all the queues um, and manage the timeouts and manage all of that, which is like clear, but a lot of work. So once you have that system that's already set up for you, then, then writing the, un the, the system that we actually needed became really simple. Um, and, and so it lets you describe arbitrary workflows via a configuration, kind of like I showed you. And to define the individual steps as simple modules that receive input and return a promise, just like I showed you. And so for the first, uh, to kind of try this out, um, there's a piece of our large build process. Uh, it's kind of a subset of it that's called Chopper. It's very simple. Um, and that's why the developer who wrote it spent like a thousand lines writing it. Um, it, it receives a build message. It, fetch, it figures out which locales are going to have to be built for that build message. And then it creates new build messages in another queue for every locale. Uh, so, and then it deletes the original message that spawned the build because it's been handled and it doesn't need to be picked up by anything else. Uh, and it, yeah, it's very trivial. And in some future incarnation of this, it doesn't even need to exist, to be completely honest. But um, it was a great way to try this out 
and see um, see if the system that I had built and written tests for, like, does it actually work when we need to do this? So if you remember that diagram a few slides ago, this is a kind of a diagram that I drew um, of how Chopper would work, where you have um, this Pontiac system sits and listens for build messages coming in from the um, coming in via the SQS queue, which is another fun thing to say, and uh, tells Swift like, hey do something about this, and then Swift and the decider and the activity workers just talk back and forth until it's all done. And we can describe that workflow just like this. Um, again, this is very much like what we envisioned before we actually knew how we were going to build this. Um, each step in the config has a namespaced activity type. This means that we can have activity types that are only known by you know, Firebird, and we can also have activity types that are shared by all the different applications at Bizarre Voice that we need to build. Um, we can specify retry and timeout options directly in the configuration. That logic doesn't have to live in the step itself. And this is extremely powerful because the goal here of undertaking all of this was not like, let's build this better. It was, let's build this so that individual pieces of it are no harder to create and maintain than they need to be. And so we took all of the complexity of figuring out retries and timeouts and all of that out, and we are able to allow developers now to just write the step. And the step itself becomes trivial. This is a step where we get the locales. Um, doesn't really matter what it does. It gets the message, um, makes some variables, uh, goes out and makes an asynchronous request to a service. That service might be down, right? We, we go and we say, get me the deployment doc. And if the service that provides the deployment doc is down, doesn't matter what a deployment doc is, if that service is down, then we'll never resolve this promise, but you'll notice that nowhere in this step do we deal with that possibility. Like we don't deal with the world where we don't resolve the promise because that's dealt with at this much higher level in the configuration itself where we're able to say, hey, if you don't hear back from this step within 10 seconds, let's consider it failed. And now we can also specify what the retry policy is gonna be in the case of failure. Um, so th this is cool, and it was really fun to figure out, and it was really great to have one of those, like, um, you know, one of those moments where you realize all that you don't know, uh, which can be really uncomfortable uh, and stuff, but also was really exciting to be like, oh, there's this whole thing I didn't know about, and now I can learn about it, uh, and it's very much outside of my area of expertise and knowledge. Um, there are some bummers about this approach uh, that I feel like I need to point out. Um, one is that with Amazon Simple Workflow, at least, as you are passing output from steps, they constrain the size of that output. And so if you're, I don't know, building a 100K JavaScript file uh, and they limit you to a 1K response, now you've got to actually put that JavaScript file somewhere. You can't be handing the file from step to step to step. Um, because activity workers need to be stateless, we can't write uh, we can't write files to disk on the activity worker itself, other than in a temporary fashion. So we have to write them to let's say S3 or something like that, and then we actually pass along the S3 URL from step to step to step. Um, so yeah, that, again, they have to be stateless because there's no guarantee that two steps in the same workflow will run on the same machine. A machine could explode, um, or we could have eight machines running that are uh, handling all of the all of the volume. Um, those are the sad parts. The the happy parts are like everything else. Um, retries and concurrency are first class. They are no longer um, no longer is that something that you have to like handle. Uh, in the step itself. It's just like part of the system. It's something you can define at this really high level. Um, there's a clear contract between the steps, which is a thing that you don't get with Gulp. And you know, I mean, you get you know, a little bit with Gulp, at least they have streams, but you definitely don't get with Grunt that there's a clear contract of what a step is going to provide um, and what a step is going to consume. 
Um, and the framework, this, this system itself, abstracts away all of the complexities that we've identified um, in, the, in this building static assets to support single page applications, the retries and all of that. Um, and finally, I brought this up just a minute ago, adding a new step is exactly as hard as it needs to be and no harder. Writing a step is exactly as hard as whatever that step does and no harder. You don't have to think about how that step fits into the big system because the system handles that for you and the step just receives some input, returns a promise that resolves its output. Uh, here's the other bummer. Uh, we aren't using this at all yet. Um, turns out that rewriting a mission crit critical build system that um, isn't perceived to not be working um, is a hard sell with the people who have the money. Um, and, and we're getting there, though. We've actually, since I last gave this talk at Cascadia JS, we've actually made some huge progress toward uh, implementing this system to replace the old build system. And so that's actually a happier story than it was a couple of months ago. Um, the good news and the thing that I'm really excited about is once we have this up and running for one project, becomes much easier for other projects to consume it because these steps will be very, um, very reusable because the contract is so clear and because the steps themselves are so simple. Uh, the lessons here, I mean, I already kind of talked about like the lesson of learning something that you didn't even know that you didn't know, which is pretty cool. Um, the, another big lesson for me is that when we took the time to sit down and really understand the problem long before we wrote any code, we were just in a so much more powerful position. Like I was able to go have that conversation with Joe and describe the problem to him articulately and eloquently and in great detail in a way that I couldn't have if I had just said like, I'm gonna rewrite this, this is terrible. Um, and so that was a really powerful experience for me and I've been trying to kind of bring that experience to other uh, efforts at Bizarre Voice now to really uh, get people to think about the problem that they're trying to solve and be articulate about the problem that they're trying to solve before they actually try to solve it. And that was a, that was a really big deal. Um, and uh, yeah, other lessons, but those were, those were kind of the, kind of the big ones. Um, so yeah, that's actually all I've got. So uh, thank you very much. Um, thanks again to Lon for his help with, with this whole system. And um, if you geek out about stuff like this, like I do, uh, I did a little podcast for 10 episodes. Oh. Um, I did a little podcast for 10 episodes. I lost it, it's gone. Uh, maybe there, yeah, yeah, yeah. all right. Um, called TTL Podcast uh, that talks about this kind of front-end ops stuff um, that, was, that was pretty cool. So check that out and uh, say hi to me on Twitter. So, oh, I do it. Thank you.